The Handsomest Drowned Man in the World by Gabriel Garcia Marquez The first children who saw the dark and slinky bulge approaching through the sea let themselves think it was an enemy ship. Then they saw it had no flags or mast and they thought it was a whale. But when it washed up on the beach, they removed the clumps of seaweed, the jellyfish tentacles, and the remains of fish and flotsam. And only then did they see that it was a drowned man. They had been playing with him all afternoon, burying him in the sand and digging him up again when someone chanced to see them and spread the alarm in the village. The man who carried him to the nearest house noticed that he weighed more than any dead man they had ever known, almost as much as a horse. And they said to each other that maybe he'd been floating too long and the water had got into his bones. When they lay him on the floor, they said, had been taller than all other men because there was barely enough room for him in the house. But they thought that maybe the ability to keep on going after that was part of the nature of a certain drowned man. He had the smell of the sea about him, and only his shape gave one to suppose that it was the corpse of a human being, because the skin was covered with a crust of mud and scales. They did not even have to clean off his face to know that the dead man was a stranger. The village was made up of only 20 odd wooden houses that had stone courtyards with no flowers and which were spread about on the end of desert-like cave. There was so little land that mothers always went about in the fear that the wind would carry off their children and the few dead that the years had caused among them had to be thrown off the cliffs. But the sea was calm and beautiful, and all the men faded into the seven boats. So when they found out the drowned man, they simply had to look at one another to see that they were all there. That night, they did not go out to work at sea. While the men went to find out anyone was missing in neighboring villages, the woman stayed behind to care for the drowned man. They took the mat off with the grass bulbs, they removed the underwater stones entangled in his hair, and they scraped the crest off with tools used for scaling fish. As they were doing that, they noticed that the vegetation in him came from faraway oceans and deep water, and that his clothes were in tarot, as if he had sailed through labyrinths of forest. They noticed too that he bore his death with pride, for he did not have that look of other drowned men who came out of the sea, or that haggard need look of men who drowned in rivers. But only when they finished cleaning him off, they became aware of the kind man he was. And it left them breathless. Not only was he the tallest, strongest, most virile, and best built man they had ever seen, but even though they were looking at him, there was no room for him in their imagination. They could not find a bed in the village large enough to lay him on, nor was there a table solid enough to use for his weight. The tallest men's holiday pants would not fit him, nor the fattest one's Sunday shirt, nor the shoes of the one with the biggest feet. Fascinated by his huge size and his beauty, the woman then decided to make him some pants from a large piece of steel and a shirt from some bridal linen so that he could continue through his death with dignity. As they stood 
sitting in a circle and gazing at the cards with green stitches. It seemed to them that the wind had never been so steady. Nor the sea so restless as on that night. And they supposed that the change had something to do with the dead man. They thought that if that magnificent man had lived in the village, his house would have had the widest doors, the highest ceilings, and the strongest floor. His bedstead would have been made from a midship frame held together by iron bolts, and his wife would have been the happiest woman. They thought that he would have had so much authority that he could have drawn fish out of the sea by simply calling their names and that he would have put so much work into his land that spring would have burst forth from among the rocks so that he would have been able to plant flowers on the cliffs. They secretly compared home to their own men thinking that for all their lives theirs were incapable of doing what he could do in one night and they ended up dismissing them deep in their hearts as the weakest meanest and most useless creatures on earth they were wandering through that maze of fantasy when the oldest woman who was the oldest had looked upon the drowned man with more compassion than passion. Sigh. He has the face of someone called Esteban. It was true. Most of them had only to take another look at him to see that he could not have any other name. The more stubborn among them, who were the youngest, still live for a few hours with the illusion that when they put his clothes on and he lay among the flowers in parent leather shoes, his name might be Lautauro. But it was a vain illusion. There had not been enough canvas. The poorly cut and worse swing pants were too tight. And the hidden strand of his heart popped the buttons on his shirt. After midnight, the whistling of the wind died down, and the sea fell into its Wednesday drowsiness. The silence put an end to any last sounds. He was as the The woman who had dressed him who had combed his hair, had cut his nails, and shaved him, were unable to hold back a shudder of pity. When they had to resign themselves to his being dragged along the ground, it was then that they understood how unhappy he must have been with that huge body, since it bothered him even after death. They could see him in life, condemned to going through door sideways, Cracking his head on cross beams, remaining on his feet during visits, not knowing what to do with his soft, pink sea lion hands, while the lady of the house looked for her most resistant chair and begged him, fried unto death, sit here, Esteban, please. And he, leaning against the wall, smiling, don't bother, ma'am, I'm fine where I am. His heels raw and his back roasted from having done the same thing so many times whenever he paid a visit. Don't bother, ma'am. I'm fine where I am. Just to avoid the embarrassment of breaking up the chair and never knowing perhaps that the ones who said don't go as the band, at least wait till the cup is ready, were the ones who later on would whisper. The big book finally left. How nice! The handsome fool has gone. That was what the women were thinking beside the body a little before dawn. Later, when they covered his face with a handkerchief so the light would not bother him, 
He looks so forever dead, so defenseless, so much like their men that the first furrows of tears opened in their hearts. It was one of the younger ones who began the whipping. The others coming too went from siles to rails and the more they sobbed, the more they felt like whipping. Because the drowned man was becoming more estimate for them. And so they wept so much, for he was the more destitute, most peaceful, and most obliging man on earth. Poor Esteban. So when the man returned with the news that the drowned man was not from the neighboring villages either, the woman felt an opening of jubilation in the midst of their tears. Praise the Lord! They sigh. He's ours. The man thought the bus was only womanish frivolity, but he, because of the difficult nighttime inquiries, all they wanted was to get rid of the bother of the newcomer once and for all. Before the sun grew strong on that arid, windless day, they improvised a letter with the remains of four masts and gaps, tying it together with ridging so that it would bear the weight of the body until they reached the cliffs. They wanted to tie the anchor from a cargo ship to him so that he would sink easily into the deepest waves where fish are blind and divers die of nostalgia, and bad currents would not bring him back to shore as what had happened with other pets. But the more they hurried, the more the woman thought of ways to waste time. But the more they hurried, the more the woman thought of ways to waste time. They walk about like startled hands, pecking with the sea charms on their breast, some interfering on one side to put a scapular of the good wind on the drowned man, some on the other side to put a wrist compass on him. And after a great deal of get away from there, woman, Stay out of the way! Look! You almost made me fall on top of the dead man! The men began to feel mistrust in their labors and started grumbling about why so many main altar decorations were a stranger. Because no matter how many nails and holy water stress he had on him, the sharks would chew him all the same. But the woman kept piling on their junk relics running back and forth, stumbling, while they released in size what they did not in tears. So that the man finally exploded with sins when he was there ever been such a past, over a drifting corpse, a drowned nobody, a piece of gold once they meet. One of the women mortified by so much lack of care, then removed the handkerchief from the dead man's face. And the men were left breathless too. He was Esteban. It was not necessary to repeat it from them. To recognize him. If they had been told Sir Walter Raleigh, even they might have been impressed with his gringo accent. The Macau on his shoulder, his cannibal killing blunderbuss. But there could be only one Esteban in the world. And there he was, stretched out like a sperm whale, shoeless, wearing the pants of an undersized child, and with those stony nails that had to be cut with a knife. They only had to take the handkerchief off his face to see that he was ashamed, that it was not his fault that he was so big, or so heavy, or so handsome. And if he had known that this was going to happen, he would have looked for a more discreet place to drown in. Seriously, I even would have tied the anchor of a galleon around my neck and staggered off. A cliff like someone who doesn't like things in order not to be upsetting people now. With this Wednesday body, as you people say, in order not to be bothering anyone with this filthy piece of cold meat that doesn't have anything to do with me. There was so much truth in his manner 
that even the most mistrustful men, the ones who felt the bitterness of endless nights at sea, fearing that their woman would tire of dreaming about them, and begin to dream of drowned men. Even they, and others who were harder still shuddered in the marrow of their bones at a Esteban's sincerity. That was how they come to hold the most splendid funeral they could ever conceive of for an abandoned drowned man and who had gone to get flowers in the neighboring villages, returned with other women who could not believe what they had been told. And those women went back for more flowers when they saw the dead man. And they brought more and more until there were so many flowers and so many people that it was hard to talk about. At the final moment, it pained them to return him to the waters as an orphan. And they chose a father and mother from among the best people and aunts and uncles and cousins so that through him all the inhabitants of the village became kinsmen some sailors who heard the way from from a distance went of course and people heard of one who had himself tied to the mainmast remembering ancient fables about sirens while they fought for the privilege of carrying him on their shoulders along the steep escarpment by the cliffs Men and women become aware for the first time of the desolation of the streets, the dryness of their courtyards, the narrowness of their dreams as they face the splendor and beauty of their drowned men. They did not need to look at one another to realize they were no longer all present, that they would never be, but he also knew that everything would be different from then on that their houses would have wider doors, higher ceilings, and stronger floors, so that Esteban's memory could go everywhere without bumping into the beams, and so that no one in the future would dare whisper, the big boof finally died. Too bad. The handsome pool has finally died. Because they were going to paint their house front gay colors to make Esteban's memory eternal. And they were going to break their backs, digging for springs among the stones and planting flowers on the cliffs, so that in the future years at dawn, the passengers on great liners would awaken, suffocated by the smell of gardens on the high seas. And the captain would have to come round from the bridge in his dress uniform, with his astrolabe, his pole star and this row of war medals and pointing to the promontory of roses on the horizon he would say in 14 languages look there where the wind is so peaceful now that it's gone to sleep beneath the bed over there where the sun's so bright that the sunflowers don't know which way it turns Yes, over there. That's the virus, really.